country once perfumed with blossoms Pistachios and ripe and grapes A thousand blazing medallions Vines twining in landscape Power of Poetry. We'll begin tonight with a song that comes from Finland uh, by Levi Maratoja. And the lyrics say, wouldn't it be incredible if all the different individual waves on the river could all go in the same direction and then move into becoming one water when they join with the ocean? It's a pretty white gloss, but I thought that's a little bit of what we're doing tonight, bringing many individual waves, all of us moving together in one direction on the pathway of the heart to become one big communal fabulousness, celebration of humanity. Katsun viran kalvuhun Kaiki kato sielta, alto suljus sulistem, uden alon tielta. 
on kuin sielu sulehen, uutuis kulkuhune, virran kerran viris pois, kusumätä kunne. Thank you. Um, I'm Jeffrey Martin, and today I'm going to do a poem called They Look Upon Us. But I had a, a, a friend, well, I don't know him personally, but Glenn, Brother Glenn, put some music together. And so I'm going to do it with, um, with his music and my poetry. So it's called They Look Upon Us. So I hope you enjoy. They look upon us. They look upon us. They look upon us. They look upon us. They look upon us as we make our way, find our way, create our way. The journey calls for strength, they remind us. Expect nothing easy, but realize that nothing can be too hard when seeds have been planted and paths already forged. They look upon us with the power that speaks of sacrifice and undaunted spirits, which have become one with the spirit world, that talks to us in quiet moments, before storms that will come, have come, and will continue coming as long as we try to make something of this life. They look upon us. They look upon us. They look upon us, these ancestors in the subtle gusts of wind, in the cleansing bursts of rain, in the magnificent shadows of sunsets. They have gone before us to etch out a path that will not allow the same mistakes to forestall our impending greatness. They give us music. They give us music. They give us music and dance and poetry so that they may witness what we've already learned. They look upon us as our baby steps transform into majestic strides towards the sacred relevance of understanding life's true purpose of being a breathing, feeling instrument of good. A breathing, feeling instrument of good. A breathing, feeling instrument of good. Music and poetry. Music and poetry. Music and poetry. They look upon us. They look upon us. They look upon us. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to night two of Power of Poetry 2021. I hope you were able to join us last night. If you have not, if you could not, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch it. It's well worth watching. We had amazing people do amazing things last night. And I'd like to thank Rosemary for starting us off and Jeffrey's beautiful poem with the music from Glenn Velez will be with us later. It's always good to call in the ancestors for something like this. We need all the help we could get and we're dedicating this year to four ancestors who did so much for putting beauty into the world. David Darling, the cellist. He was great at getting people to jump into music wholeheartedly. Barry Lopez, the wonderful writer. If it wouldn't have been for Barry's books, I never would have gone to the desert and the red rocks and the Arctic and the Grand Canyon rafting and just so many things from him. He had a way of writing about the natural world that was far beyond anybody else I've ever seen. And then Brian Doyle, great essayist. We celebrated him last night. Um, also a novelist, I have to say that. And Greg Kimura, my 
brother. And Brian and Greg each died four years ago within a month of each other, both of brain tumors, and it was just such a loss. It's like Obi-Wan would have said, you could feel it in the force that some of the heart of this planet is gone. Um, I'm very excited about tonight. I told a story last night that ended with a wedding and a celebration. And tonight is going to be our celebration. The night will be divided into four segments, as you've probably seen on the program. And we also have a bunch of art and music to show you that poetry, the word actually comes from the Greek poesis, that means to create. So poetry is the act of creation, and we're showing that in many different ways tonight. And I thought I would sneak in a poem here and a quick story, and then we'll go right to our first segment. And the poem I'd like to read is by Pablo Neruda. It's called Poetry. And something ignited in my soul, fever or unremembered wings, and I went my own way, deciphering that burning fire. And I wrote the first bare line, bare, without substance, pure foolishness, pure wisdom of one who knows nothing. And suddenly I saw the heavens unfastened and open. And at the end of Neruda's amazing life, he was in Caracas, Venezuela at the National Theater. He gave a long reading to a packed house. And at the end, he said, my friends, if there's anything else you'd like me to read, please let me know. And someone said, could you please read number 19 of 20 love songs and a poem of despair? And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't bring that with me. And at that point, <clears throat> 400 members of the audience stood up and recited the poem together. That says something about a country. So our first act or segment tonight is about kindness and there could never be enough kindness in the world. And this was the easiest one for me to find poets because they all are the epitome of kindness. Um, there's nothing more I could say about them. You'll see from their poems. Um, so I'm going to let them begin. Hello out there, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Jack Riddle. I'm from Saugatuck, Michigan. And if anyone knows how to educate the heart, it's certainly Alan Cohen. Uh, we're all so grateful to him. And I've come to know some new educators of the heart and some dear old friends um, who I never get to see except this way. <laughs> um, I want to thank Mickey and Peter for doing such a wonderful job for us. Uh, it's a kindness to give up your face and be behind the scenes. Um, I taught uh, poetry writing for 38 years in a college. A college is one of those places that seldom educates the heart. Education should be about learning, but I believe the teaching should be about giving and not trying to get the most or trying to teach somebody to master something, but to give them poetry for the rest of their lives. And the best thing I could hear from a student would be that you gave me back what I had up until I was about in fifth grade. And I couldn't hear anything better. The other odd thing that happens in a university and a college is that because they educate from here up, they grade. And so how in the world can a poem or a piece of music 
that's supposed to educate the heart. How do you grade the heart? How do you do that? When I started, I was stuck having to grade. And I noticed every time that I would uh, point out to a student, hey, look what happens if you, if you take your, this line here and just move it up two spots, look what happens. And I noticed that nothing happened much in the student. And this went on for my whole first year and I, I, I couldn't figure it out until I realized one night that when I was doing that wonderful thing, they were going, my grade went down. And so from then on, there were no more grades. There were only A's. The faculty accosted me for this and said, you have no academic standards. And I thought for a second and said, you're right. My standards are so much higher than that. I uh, had a student who had lost his best friend in a car accident two days before class. And he scribbled out his news from the heart. And of course, it wasn't ready yet to be a poem, a full poem, but he wrote it. The point was he got it onto that piece of paper. Later that day, I ran into a faculty member who said, one of your students showed me a poem. And I said, oh, and he said, yeah, uh, it's that student who lost his friend. And I said, oh, and he said, uh, you taught, you teach that student, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, it's not any good. And I said, the poem is not any good. And he said, no, it's not any good. And I said, would you tell me the value of it? And then walked away. And this, uh, this poem comes from that. After hearing the professor say, she's just an average student. How great never to be that bully, excellent. Not even the bland and shy acolyte, good. Average, simply average. Like all the robins, jays, juncos, chickadees, even wood ducks, those charmingly helmeted harlequins who never arrive without floating a surprise over any creek or pond are average when it comes to wood ducks. Elephants, unless they rival the heft and height of Jumbo are, well, average elephants. The experts, of course, determine what is above average, whether elephant or student. While trillium, sweet woodruff, owls, moles, goldenrod, and thyme hold to the way they became. They cannot rise to the rigor of demand or slough off into a lower caste. Those who know say Wedding Veil is indeed an excellent vine, argue its worth over, say, Euonymus, but Euonymus is Euonymus. Wisteria is wisteria, just as English ivy is English ivy. The former cascading through a pergola, the latter climbing and twisting its way up the side of a wall, a tree. So come and let's redeem the average. After all, for all I know, I am an average coffee drinker on an average early morning, watching an average squirrel, searching for all the average acorns in our average yard, readying for yet another. Jack Riddle, we missed the last two words of your, of your performance. You said readying for just another. 
average winner. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. Somebody out there, I think Naomi's muting me. <laughs> Oh, well, sweet average coffee drinker. Um, you sure do open up my heart. Thank you. I'm Rosemary Watola Tromer. I come from the western slope of Colorado, where I live on the mighty banks of the San Miguel River. This poem is for Kathy. Watching my friend pretend her heart isn't breaking. On Earth, just one teaspoon of neutron star would weigh six billion tons. Six billion tons is the equivalent of every animal on Earth, including the insects, times three. Six billion tons sounds impossible until I consider how it is to swallow grief. Just one teaspoon, and one may as well have consumed a neutron star. How dense it is. How it carries in it the memory of collapse. How impossible to move then. How difficult to believe anything could ever lift that weight. There are many reasons to treat each other with great tenderness. One is the sheer miracle that we are here together on a dying planet, on a planet surrounded by dying stars. And the other is that none of us can see what anyone else has swallowed. Thank you. beautiful rosemary thank you i love that poem i'm allison luderman i'm zooming in from a busy uh, urban street in oakland california and this poem called candle um, is for my husband um, uh, when what happened to him one early morning on our street not yet 7 a.m., our street still a forest of shadows, and a woman springs out from behind a row of trash cans to yank, panic-stricken, on the passenger side of Lee's car. He lets her in. She's about 30, dirty blonde, hard used, trembling all over like a soaked cat. Please help me, he'll kill me if he finds I'm leaving, she cries. So he drives her slumped down in the seat to Mi Pueblo Market, half a mile away, then gives her what's in his wallet, all of it, he's like that, urging her while he does to get the hell out of Dodge as fast and as far as she can. Then fights freeway traffic to reach his job at the machine shop in Hayward, where he calls me, shaking now himself. He's a rescuer of feral cats, this quiet man who will sit by a saucer of milk for hours, soothing the terrified creature until it can take nourishment. But he couldn't save this woman. And sometimes in summer, when our windows are open, we hear the voices screaming, shut the fuck up before I give you something to cry about. Yet, I tell him, in these vicious times, any small pre-dawn kindness can be a candle that doesn't conquer the dark, but cracks it just to peep at the seams. Her name was Megan. Where did she go then, with her skinny, tattooed wrists and dripping hair? Into the wind and rain, like any wild thing into the storm of living. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jack, Rosemary, Alan, and everyone 
who has put this evening together. I'm Naomi Shihab Nye, speaking from old downtown San Antonio, Texas, near the little San Antonio River. And I read my poem tonight for all of the people, many young people who are in transit and in difficulty and surely in fear at the Texas border tonight. And also I speak for the teachers and poets who have been moving that direction, wanting to hear their stories, asking them to witness what they've seen, what they've lived through. Thank you for emphasizing pathways to the heart after such a year, especially, but always. Mediterranean blue. If you are the child of a refugee, you do not sleep easily when they are crossing the sea on small rafts and you know they can't swim. My father couldn't swim either. He swam through sorrow though and made it to the other side on a ship, pitching his old clothes overboard at landing, then tried to be happy, make a new life. But something inside him was always paddling home, clinging to anything that floated, a story, a food, or face. They are the bravest people on earth right now. Don't dare look down on them. Each mind a universe swirling as many details as yours, as much love for a humble place. Now the shirt is torn, the sea too wide for comfort, and nowhere to receive a letter for a very long time. And if we can reach out a hand, we better. Thank you. Thank you. All of those were just beautiful. Uh, I would like to introduce the people who are making this possible on the technical side of things. I've spent so much time working on this. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Mickey Hart, who I knew when he was about eight years old. He was a student at my school and later in my class, and he's become a good friend and a teacher to me, too. Mickey. I uh, hope you are uh, enjoying this, and I'm really glad to be part of helping to bring this to you, and uh, um, just just thrilled that we're be, being able to do it this year. So uh, enjoy the rest of the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna head out, and we'll, we'll we'll meet Pete in a moment. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Hi, I'm Pete Bates, and um, Alan asked me to do this about two months ago, and I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, and as a result, I have learned tons, and I am absolutely honored to be a part of this group. Thank you. Hey, Pete. Hey, Mickey. We're going to have our first artistic interlude. My favorite artist is named Matthew Palmer. He lives on San Juan Island in Puget Sound. He won an award a couple years ago for being the best young wildlife artist in the United States and has works in many national parks. Those are not the things he really is proudest of because they're just representational. Um, the first time he ever came here, we went for a walk and the whole time he was just picking up rocks and sticks unconsciously and just playing with them and seeing how they fit together. And he just knows how to go to the natural world for inspiration and put what he sees into art, as you'll see in a second. So we're gonna see a video that Matthew put together, kind of showing his process of how he gets to things. And we had had a good talk recently about a poem by Rumi called The Guest House. And he's using that as part of the soundtrack of the poem. The 
This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Matthew Palmer. Um, his website is called MatthewGrayPalmer.com, and you'll be amazed with what you see. So we're going to segue from kindness to redemption. And there was a man named Bo Lozoff who was a prison activist. 
And way back when I was younger, I volunteered in the local prison for over 10 years, working with these men that were in there, um, doing poems and stories, bringing in guests. And I brought Bo in one time. They wanted him. He gave books away to anyone in prison that wanted them. And his most famous book is called We Are All Doing Time. And the kindness part of him is when the Dalai Lama came to visit the United States once, the only um, organization he visited was Bose. And he told him the reason was because it had kindness in the name. It's called the Human Kindness Foundation. And although he's died, the foundation is still going on doing the work. And I've always loved redemption stories. And it was amazing when I would go into the prison and some of the people here, I know Allison went in and we had a profound day at the very first power of poetry. Um, some of the others have done that also. And um, I learned so much more there than I so-called taught. Um, I asked the men at the end, what did they value the most about the things we had done together? And they said that you showed up. That was what was so important to them. So we have here, um, let's see, one, two, three. We have five people in the redemption part, um, all magnificent poets in one way or another. And I just wanted to mention two of them. Frank Escamilla, who will be reading second to last, um, came here a couple years ago. And at that time I was volunteering in the alternative school here that they called the Opportunity Center, which was a euphemism for the garbage can of the school system where they threw kids away when they didn't want them anymore. And Frank within minutes did amazing things and got right to their hearts. He'll talk a little more about himself. And finally, Saucy Hill, my brother from Mendocino, who didn't just like poetry, but poetry radically changed his life, as he will tell you. So we also have uh, Ellie Matsura, who will be reading one of Ellen Bass's poems, Ellen Teaches in the Prison. We'll see a video of Luis Rodriguez, who's responsible for tonight, and that he inspired me to start this poetry festival in 2002. And uh, he's on video tonight. He's doing a sweat lodge healing ceremony for his granddaughters who are in trouble. And Carrie Gunter Seymour, who also teaches in prison. So we're going to start with Ellie. Um, as Alan said, I'm Eleanor Matsura, or some of you may know me as Ellie. And I am reading Bringing Flowers to Soledad by Ellen Bass. <clears throat> it wasn't when Mr. M saw the little meadow blooming on the brown metal table. I'll have such a short time with these, he said, as I pushed a paper cup of flowers toward him. Nor was it the way we spoke then about beauty and loss, the great themes of poetry. Mr. H bowing to the starry faces of Jasmine. This is the first flower I've smelled in 20 years. And it wasn't when Mr. L quietly slipped out each stalk of lavender, thin as pencil lead and almost invisibly slowly, slowly folded them into a sheet of paper, nor the way the others quietly passed him their own lavender, studded with the tiniest velvet nubs, wordlessly, as though he were a coyote who would smuggle them across the border. And it wasn't when Mr. S insisted he had, as a Native American, rights to his rituals, sage, sweet corn, tobacco, and no one could stop him. It was the law from taking this sacred plant back to his cell. 
Mr. J had heard it all before. I can't listen to this, he muttered, shoving back his chair, walking out the scarred door. And it wasn't even when Mr. S drank the water the flowers were drinking, though with that it began. A small wind stirred in that windowless room and Mr. S bit the heads off the Peruvian lilies, crushing their pink sepals and the gold inner petals flecked with maroon, their silvery filaments holding up the dark pollen-laden anthers. He chewed like a horse, maybe one known by his ancestors, great teeth grinding side to side, saliva rushing, slavering, buds sudsing, the veined rose petals, the spicy sweet peas. He grazed like a stallion who owned the pasture he was fenced in, standing knee deep in the lavish grass, his soft lips frothing with blossoms. Thank you. Thank you all again for having me here reading uh, at this amazing, beautiful poetry festival. Uh, thanks to Alan Cohen and all the organizers, uh, my good friend Alan. We go back many, many years. I appreciate everything he's done to bring poetry to community, to the world. Um, this next poem has to do with one of the things I did. I was in um, jails, juvenile hall, and two adult facilities as a young man. Um, I'm formerly incarcerated, but I've been far removed from that time. Um, and I have a son who did 15 years in the Illinois State Prison System. Uh, he survived, he's now 10 years paroled, he's doing really good. He's a father and grandfather. He's trying to be a decent, clean and sober man. He's doing a very good job. It's hard, it's difficult, but he's he's doing amazing. And um, that's my son, Ramito. And I wrote books and a lot of it had to do with him. I have three sons and a daughter and they all are amazingly beautiful but my son went through the hardest time but we're we're in good shape we're good straights now uh but one of the things i did i was at 25 years old um i decided to go back to prisons not as a prisoner but to do poetry to do creative writing to workshops i started at chino prison in california and again i have to apologize for the plane there yeah, we have a little airport nearby um but the prison system at the time was not really open to writers and poets and artists, dancers, or theater people, as pretty much a lot of it has changed where a lot of people can't come in that way. 40 years ago, 1980, when I started doing these creative writing workshops, it was um, not acceptable. But somebody wanted me there. There was probably a staff, the warden, somebody wanted me there. Over the years, then I also did uh, poetry readings in different joints and I also did um, uh, talks and healing circles uh, but I started again doing creative writing in in prison at a high security prison um, Lancaster State Prison here about an hour from my home here in California in 2007 and I've been doing these creative writing classes ever since I had a short hiatus I came back in 2016 and I've been going steadily ever since until the pandemic hit in the pandemic of last year that it started, I think around April, they were not allowing any in-person instruction, which I really miss. I'm still in touch with some of the guys. Some of the guys have been released. Um, I still do um, lesson plans, by the way. I still give them lesson plans. I've been redoing them for 13 or 15 week stretches, and they've been trying to accomplish them as much as they can. That's my connection right now. I hope that when all goes well, we can go back into the prison systems and continue with this amazing work. Uh, this is a poem that came out of that work. I did an anthology last year called Make a Poem Cry, uh, which was from my creative writing classes at Lancaster State Prison. It was co-edited by myself and um, um, a man who I know very well and respect who did 38 years in the state prison system, Kenneth E. Hartman. We put together this book through Tia Chucha Press, which the people might know, I founded Tia Chucha Press oh, more than 30 years ago in Chicago, and we took it to LA. We've published a lot of poetry, uh, collections, anthologies. We've been doing it, I don't know. I mean, just amazing work, multicultural, cross-cultural works that maybe other people may not publish, emerging poets, but also some well-known poets. Dear Chucha Press, uh, you can go to um, 
T-I-A-C-H-U-C-H-A.org. And then uh, we have a whole culture center and bookstore, but there's a link for the press. You can know more about it. Anyway, this poem is called Make a Poem Cry. And it's um, it starts with a line by one of the um, young men in my classes who's serving a life without possibility of parole. He's a great, a great, amazing poet. And his line goes like this. I can't see him coming from my eye. So I had to make this poem cry. You can chain the body, the face, the eyes, the way hands move coarsely over cement or deftly on tattooed skin with needle. You can cage the withered membrane, the withered dream, the way razor wire shouts, yells, and batons can wither spirit. But how can you imprison a poem? How can a melody be locked up, locked down? Yes, even caged birds sing, even grass sprouts through asphalt, even a flower blooms in a desert. And the gardens of trauma we call the incarcerated can also spring with the vitality of a deep thought, an emotion buried beneath the facades, deep as rage, deep as grief, the grief beneath all rages. The blood of such poems, songs, emotions, thoughts, dances are what flows in all art, stages, films, books. The keys to liberation are in the heart, in the mind, behind the cranial sky. The imagination is boundless, the inexhaustible in any imprisoned system. And remember, we are all in some kind of prison. If only the contrived freedoms society professes can flow from such water. I want to thank you all. I want to dedicate this to all the men and women uh, in the prisons. Uh, um, when they end the carceral state, in mass incarceration, uh, bring in uh, transformative, restorative justice practices, treatment, um, mental health work, proper, all these things that we all know can be done. Um, and again, thank you for listening and having me read these poems. Blessings to all. My name is Carrie Gunter Seymour. I too want to thank Alan and Evie and Nikki and Pete for these two amazing evenings. I'm in Southeastern Ohio. I'm a far neighbor of Alan and Evie. And it was my privilege. And I felt so blessed to have been invited to provide virtual journaling slash poetry workshops this past winter to incarcerated teens and adults and women in recovery facilities. And this poem grew from that experience. Zoom journaling workshop at the Women's Reformatory. They came to me mannequins, too long in storage, faces masked, a window of windows, their eyes staring me down like a series of Margaret King paintings. My face, large screened in the chow hall, blushed toothy. My heart tapping jig to rib. I understand labels, I say. I've spent a lifetime Appalachian. Hillbilly, white trash, hick. This I know. We think it's easier to forget than remember to resist holy places within us, fearing they too will chew our bones. To that I say, we are but leaves whirling a buckled floor, tossed like loose coins, reflections we glance at a distance. Tell me, when you close your eyes, where do you go? Something about wood smoke, says one, and jolly ranchers. Write it down. To a cabin, says another. An overstuffed couch, birds outside chirping at the feeder, dinner sizzling on the grill. You need a hammock there, jokes another. We laugh. Write it down. 
I grew up on I-71 North, lit up by headlights, squints a pixie. Windows that slid side to side, left open for what air could be had. Mosquitoes, crickets, squawks and thuds. Mom drunk again. I cut myself, says another, softly, a moth probe in the dark. Write it down. Dig fossils, open graves, take up the blanched eye of grief. Slam doors, plant flowers, grow. Who are you now? Make a list, write it down. I am compassionate. I'm hardworking. I'm adaptive. I'm creative. I'm accountable. I am kind. I am worthy. Labels, I say. Proof in black and white. Labels. They clap, sing like sisters, and I, their foster cousin, dream them all the way back home. We, I've got all my sisters with me. We are family. Rise up all my sisters and sing. Thank you. It was beautiful. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, wow, it's going to take a second. Sorry, y'all. You're going to breathe with me for a second because that was, that was really beautiful. Um, my name is Frank Escamilla. Happy to be here. Thank you, Alan, for the invitation. Um, you know, it's a, a blessing to know you and to know that this thing happens every year and all the amazing work that you put into it. Um, I also got to meet Alan at a, at a men's retreat in the middle of the woods. Um, I'm from Boyle Heights, East Los Angeles, y'all. So I didn't know I was going to run into someone from Logan, Ohio, in the middle of the woods. So that was that was quite a quite, quite a blessing. Um, and yeah, I, I um, my other name is Bus Stop Prophet. Um, and like I said, where I was raised, not many people make it out uh, either alive or not put behind bars and. Truthfully, the only difference for me was, was that I discovered writing early because I was almost there too, um, you know, and, and uh, writing saved my life. Writing helped me find a different path. Um, it's allowed me to give back to my community also. I, I started um, really young when I stepped away from, from the, you know, getting too far into the gang life. I, I had to do something because I knew I was a gatherer of people and a builder of community and I started giving workshops in in uh in, in the alley you know in the side of the freeway where there was some earth to sit on right and i just invite people like yo let's just try to learn something and that evolved you know and that 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 uh strengthened the calling that i received a long time ago and and it just led me on a path where i got to work in the prison system where i got to work in in different camps and support these young people um who didn't receive that that pen early on, you know, um, who society tries to write off, but um, there's magic, y'all. There's magic that lives in these places. Um, and we just have to act as mirrors, right? And reflect it so they can remember. Um, so y'all, thank you so much. Yeah, like I said, I've been blessed. I've worked with many organizations. Louis is, is a mentor of mine and I'm always happy to see him. I've worked with Via Chuchas as well as an organization called Street Poets and I just, you know, my heart is in this work. My heart is uh, is trying to think: how do we plant seeds, right? Or how do we take these seeds from from these these uh, these places that are not allowing them to grow and plant them in good gardens? Uh, so I got a poem that I want to share with you right now, and it's one of the many poems that explains why I do the work that I do, and it's called "My Cousin Ricky." Um, it goes like this. 
This poem's from my cousin Ricky and the hundred questions why. His clock skipped a tick and now we can't talk. So we're left to cry the ocean dry. The bullet didn't have his name on it. It had a description. Young, minority, male, full of dreams, hopes, infinite potential. The bullet didn't care what he had been through. Because bullets only do what they're meant to. He was 23. Just a little younger than me when he died. And although it's been years, I can still taste the salt from the tears that I cried. The night he got shot. I hoped and I prayed that everything would be fine, but I've been through this too many times and I know that it's not. See, cause where we grew up, children choke on angel's breath if they inhale too deep. And invisible lines act as do not enter signs, mocking off gang territory street by street. It's a hood mentality. You learn to watch your back or you risk losing it. You're either a punk, a chavala, or you're down for your shit, see. You don't even have to gangbang to be a part of this. I knew this kid who, who got killed walking to the corner market to get his little sister some milk. He was 18 with a bullet lodged in his spine, laying on a careless concrete block, bleeding, screaming, crying. And I no longer live there, but sometimes I swear I can still hear his mother crying. And the ironic part is just like my cousin, he wasn't from anywhere. Just like my cousin, he shaved his head bald because he started to lose his hair. And so we all had to learn the hard way that death, like life, it just isn't fair. So who do I blame? Where do I focus the wrath of my pain? Do I blame the government? Does the right to bear arms, give my cousin the right to bear his dying brother in his arms? Or his mother the right to bury her seed knowing it'll never grow again? Do I blame the kid that did this? The child that took my cousin's life? See, I wanna find that kid. I wanna find them and I wanna, I wanna teach them. I wanna teach him that there's another way. I wanna tell him that I know he's scared, but it's gonna be okay. I wanna show him that the world is bigger than the block, that he is not a waste or a victim and that the hate needs to stop. I wanna tell him about my cousin, how he had a smile that was contagious and all the mess we used to get into growing up in the hood and how he was by no means innocent, but he was good. He was good. I wanna tell this kid that we are all products of our decisions and that if he needs to talk, that I'll listen. I wanna tell this kid that even though he took my family from me, that I forgive him. So this poem's for my cousin Ricky and the hundred questions why his clock skipped the tick and now we can't talk. So we're left to cry the ocean dry. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's on me. That was that, that was so powerful, man. I'm stuck, you know, because I live that life. My name is Kisasi. And I too met Alan in the woods somewhere, you know, in Mendocino. 
And just to get an understanding of where I come from, at the age of 16 years old, I was arrested three days after my 16th birthday, April 19th. I had turned 16, April 22nd. I was arrested for murder. First offense, never been arrested. And I was convicted as an adult and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Now, being there so young, you know, I wasn't innocent for first and foremost, but being there so young, I was forced to adapt to a colony of society's rejects. And I often said, you know, I was raised and ate breakfast with sociopaths, you know. So this was my upbringing. I elevated into prison life, the gangs, the prison uh, politics. I was actually in the prison that uh, Luis Rodriguez teach at now, uh, Lancaster. VR. And I raised myself where I elevated in the stature of the prison life and the street gangs, and I became a shock off where I was telling grown men what to do. And because of this, I became known by the institution as a, uh, a menace to that small society of, uh, I mean, that small colony of society's rejects. And they put me in a hole one time after a riot and locked me into solitary confinement to show me a lesson. Without any paperwork, without any write-ups, I was left into this metal box, a metal door and granite walls, one rack, thin mattress, and all I had was myself and my thoughts. There was no human interaction. This was called solitary confinement. So for 98 days, I spent in this place. And I realized that through my journey, there was nothing that I feared. There was no death. There was no stabbing. There was no shooting. There was no gang brawl. There was any, no consequences to these things that I feared, except for losing my mind. And that's the very thing that uh, solitary confinement was designed for to break the mind and spirit. The only thing that I had to keep me in touch with spirit and my sanity was poetry. I would write poetry on everything. I would write it on the back of, you know, inmate request forms, grievances. I, I would write it on toilet paper, napkins, and anything that I can get my hands on. And they stopped giving me these things because they said that was destruction of state property. So, I took the pencil and I began to write poetry all over the walls. And to keep myself from losing my mind, I literally, literally covered the walls in poetry from the ceiling to everything. They brought in a psych to read the poetry to make sure that I wasn't suicidal or threatening. But it, something happened to me in that moment. I realized that I wasn't the animal that they made me out to be and that I accepted to be. I realized that there was more to me and I had to hear it with my own voice in the confines of solitary confinement. So when I stepped out of that cell, I didn't step out of that cell someone insane like it was designed to do. I literally stepped out of that cell a poet. Of all things, a gang member, murderer, minister to society, lock him at the bottom of the prison and he comes out a poet. So now, after all of these years, 27 years and eight months I spent in prison. Imagine him coming to you saying, you're going home tomorrow at five. Be ready. After all this time, I knew who I no longer wanted to be, but I had no idea who I would become once, re once released. You see, society was a world that I had left with a 16-year-old understanding. 
So now here I'm going back in my mid forties to a society that I had no understanding of. So I sat in that little bitty cell and I wrote a poem. What I always did when I was distressed. And this is the poem that came out. It's actually the last poem I wrote in prison, waiting to come home. And it's called Still Good In Me. And it goes. My father beat my mother into induced labor having fist fights with grown men, always trying to save her. Hopes of being a kid again was something to save her. Never knew I'd see the pen, but a few days later, a child made man in a man-made trial then called by the world a life taker, a youth prison knife taker. Surrounded by concrete like the monkey guard, man. Plus life began to look odd and feudal lords and tribal wars was a world of chaos at its core. A little brother gang banging at the door and scraping brothers up as a chore. At first step haunted, trained by 4300 and praying on the faces that look haunted. My habitats like iron woods, body tatted, a pup running with wolves, but I was searching for a part of me still good. The graffiti on the walls says no warning shots. And the will to survive now is all I got, not to mention I've been praying a lot. But the rage got my emotions in the knot, like a burner in the place of a Glock or a best friend shot on a prison yard, smoking pot, listening to pop. Hard lessons at night point I'm forced to learn why shot callers doing shoe terms, politicians treat the subject like a journal. Meanwhile, breath is my only concern and one with the kind to kill perm. This must be a glimpse of how hell be, knowing only God can help me. The devil's been trying to melt me, but that's not the life I was dealt, see. I knew that there was still good in me to see the man that I could be, should be, would be. That's when the reality of it all took me. You see, I knew I could be repentant, but I had blood spilled enemies who hated the thought of forgiving me with the thirst for rep dreams of killing me. Still, the efficaciousness of prayer was healing me. I was a little boy living life like a grown man, but being guided by a strong hand, understand? While raised by the best of society's rejects, my honors now reflex to see how deep my thoughts get, like knowing I cold the dark gets, but that hadn't touched my heart yet. If standing on my own to its success, I got that. After falling short, man, I'm right back, a tortured soul that wouldn't crack. I bled for it. I teared for it. I killed for it and served 27 years for it. But my Lord didn't bring me this far to blow it. There's something in me, man. I know it. I see it now despite the hood in me. I'm my mother's child, so there's good in me. A service to God and family with dignity as it should be. So like lost angels and them palm trees, tomorrow I'll lift my head and be free. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. So powerful. I've had the privilege of watching Sasi every year deepen and mature, become a leader, works with youth. I have the utmost respect for that man and for all of you who are doing this work. One thing I was reminded of watching these, when I was working in the prison, there was this one young man, very bright, and they had to just wear the same uniform all the time. But each week his shirt had creases in different patterns. And I said, what's with that? And he says, they're trying to get every bit of creativity out of us, but I'll always find a way. And that's just so cool. So I have the honor now to introduce the next piece of artwork that we're going to have. Uh, there's this person I know pretty well sitting next to me, Evie Edelman, my wife. 
and periodically she disappears into her lair in the basement, which she calls her art room. Mm -hmm. And she makes these collages, uh, spends hours on them, agonizes, celebrates, and they're like dreams. And we're going to see a slideshow of her collages. And Matthew, whose video we saw just a few minutes ago, has a brother, Charlie, who goes as Chuck Palmer, an um, anonymous elder. It's his stage name. He's a composer, a drummer, a music producer. He's been nominated for Grammys at least twice that I know of. And they collaborated. Evie is also a pianist. So in this accompanying music, uh, when you hear the piano, that's her. And um, we're going to just go into collage dreamland for a few minutes.
looks like people like enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, this next group gives me so much joy. I mentioned last night I got one good idea a year, and in, I think 1912, I got the idea to have a poetry program for young people. We call it Wellspring of Imagination. Um, our most important resources, I think, are our youth and imagination. And that's what we need to make this a better world. And we get together with anywhere between 12 and 16 young people for three days in a lodge in the woods. We spend time outside. We have three poet teachers. There's a number of them with us today. We work on the poetry. We have a program for the community concert, if you will, where they show what they've done. And then one of the teachers becomes their mentor for the next year and works on their poetry. And I'm just so impressed with what these people have done. Uh, the ones in this first group, one is petitioning the UN at this time for indigenous rights, rights for indigenous women. One is about to leave her job as a brilliant computer engineer to go rock climbing, visiting national parks for the next two years, because that's a hard thing to do when you retire at 65. It's easier to do when you're 25. Um, one has won the state uh, poetry out loud contest and is seeking entrance into graduate school to pursue his career as a writer. And the last one is a young lady who's a poet and a visual artist who is one big walking heart. And someday she'll join the Alice and Naomi Rosemary Club. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let them do their thing right now. Saria, you're first. Hi guys, uh, I cannot turn on my camera because I had messed up times. I live in Arizona, so I'm kind of far away and I messed up times. I'm really sorry about that. And I'm really, really sorry about any background noise. So sorry. But Dagata, she's with Taylor Jose. She tutor flat in Shleet Lokwa, but she chin, she talk play, she mat lag play, Andy Taylor San Jose. She was seen, she was on Rita Kai, Danny Taylor Senior Jose. Hi, my name is Rhea Taylor. I'm White Man Apache in Navajo. I'm 19 years old and I served as the Arizona Youth Poet Laureate, which is how I got to go to Wellspring in the first place. And I have so much appreciation for Alan and everything that he does and all the other Wellspring readers. And I'm excited that you guys get to hear them too. But I'm going to read a poem that I wrote last year. I attended the um, Emerging Diné Writers Institute, which was a part of Diné College but it's called, I'm thinking about strawberries. I'm thinking about strawberries, thinking about the man who picked them for me. I wonder if he has a granddaughter. I wonder if his granddaughter thinks like I do. I'm thinking about when I was at home eating spaghetti and commodity cheese, when my grandpa walked in covered in dirt, lunchbox in hand, me hugging him, so happy to see him home, wondering why he has to work, why he can't just stay home with me. I wonder if she wonders the same about her grandpa. I'm sitting here eating raspberries, thinking about sunflowers. I wonder if they keep a conversation with the sun all day. I wonder if they ever say thank you for the nutrients. I'm sitting here thinking about my siblings. I wonder how the bat feels when Jawan swings, when Austin decides dinosaurs out loud. I wonder if the air swirls around him. I'm thinking about how Shania laughs so loudly at nothing. I wonder what Colton thinks about when he sees clouds. I wonder if the clouds wave to him like they used to wave to me. I'm thinking about Brandon and how he finds so much beauty in the world to paint it. I'm thinking about how the grass holds Julian when he falls. I'm thinking about Alyssa saying hello to the ocean. I'm thinking about COVID. I wonder how the air feels passing along such a virus. If it feels ashamed or glad, tired of the humans who continue to pollute it. I think I should have a sit down with the air and beg it to stop harming my people. Tell it about how I've already lost so many and I can't lose anymore. I'm thinking about my grandma, Lita Walker, holding my hand when we walked. I wonder what my energy was when it passed to her. 
I wonder if she felt so loved and appreciated in that moment. Like I have always felt with her. I'm thinking about how we laughed together around the world, yet so far apart, talking about Sherwin's poems, my need to try my best and how she misses eating breakfast together. I'm outside listening to thunder, each crack and boom. I wonder if the crack and boom are having a conversation. I wonder if they know I'm listening. Maybe they're talking about me, calling me a snoop and sending me rain so I'll leave them alone. I can feel the wind. I wonder if the wind and the clouds are in love. If so, I'm happy for them. I'm thinking about the time my grandma Rita and I went to Sholo together. We ate at Wendy's and joked with one another. I wonder if the earth could feel my love for my grandma. Wondering if the air danced around us quietly, not wanting to interrupt. I'm thinking about my friends. How Cynthia screams along to songs in the, in the car. How Sage sings and plays the guitar. The way Samuel tells me what words mean and Hopi. I'm thinking about Candy smiling at little dogs and leaving Peter voicemails in the evening. Thinking about how the stars wrap around us like a blanket and how the blue jay sings us a tune. I'm thinking about the hummingbirds tattooed on my auntie's leg. I wonder what real hummingbirds think when they see it. I wonder if they giggle, embarrassed or smug. I'm thinking about how they come by to see my auntie and they tell all their friends about the tattoo. I'm thinking about how hummingbirds sit by my auntie's window to listen to her sewing machine hum. I'm curious about the earth, the dirt and how it connects to me. I wonder if the sun likes kissing our skin every day. I wonder if the rain misses me when I'm not around. I'm thinking about my uncle Jay. I wonder if he thinks about the earth too when he's out fighting fires, if he feels bad for the plants that have passed on, nodding at them as he walks by. I'm thinking about the time we hugged at my sunrise dance. I felt scared and small, and somehow my uncle transferred strength to me. I'm thinking about energy, the energy of my love and curiosity, my sadness, my breathing, my anger, and the rain. Sometimes when I sit outside, I can hear my heart beating, and I can't help but wonder about the Kiwis. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you for letting me read. And again, I'm so sorry about all the background noise. But yes, thank you so much, guys. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Liz. I'm the aforementioned uh, kid who's going to go to quit my job and uh, travel to climb. Um, Rosemary mentioned last night that I, um, someone who happened to be me, I uh, said that I, uh, the, so the Wellspring, I, I'm a former Wellspring poet um, from 2013, and I'm going to be turning 25 this year, so I'm no longer a youth poet, but I'm happy to represent the former youth poets of Wellspring. Um, someone online said that uh, the pandemic was making us nostalgic for like pre-pandemic times, um, but uh, I think it's kind of blending into like a general nostalgia. I think we're all just like nostalgic for, for past times right now. Um, so I wrote a poem uh, about uh, my childhood and the woman who um, cut my hair when I was a kid. Um, it's called Galena. Morning light arrested by the fogged window. All speed diffused, particles scattered through foamy air. I always sneeze when I enter, salon thick with, with dust, follicles, or discarded parts. It smells like, like nail polish remover, wintergreen, gum, lemon cleaning solution, linoleum. I never remember the true name of this storefront, this place we call Galena's after the woman with a burbling Russian accent and fake eyelashes who sees me twice a year. Water, a penetrating heat, my head heavy in the sink, cold ceramic on my neck. Galena's acrylic nails, pastel as Christmas baubles, rake furrows down my scalp. I close my eyes, blink open to burgundy-lined lips. Galena smiles and swivels me. Much of Galena looks as if it could crack under the touch. Hair bleached and sprayed stiff could crack like toffee. Foundation splits upon laugh lines. Continental plates meet when she smiles. I was blonde as a toddler, hair snarled and nearly reflective. Each year, the pale band slipped farther down my neck. Dark blonde, dirty blonde, blonde tips, barely even blonde, though I still wanted to claim the label. Pinch the few strands in my hand, hold them to the sun. But now, scissors, a sound like dry leaves or shimmering. Galena snips the ends of a ticker tape. 
renders me a shade darker, a shade less heavy, clusters of debris on the plastic. Mom in the corner reads a stained magazine in the fogged August sun, thumbs over last year's patio furniture tips. Galena gestures to a photo of her grandkids on the wall, the date red and loud in the corner. I tell her they're beautiful and they are. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, peace to you all. Uh, my name is Thomas Ellison. Uh, I'm a spoken word artist, uh, author, and poet from Dayton, Ohio, by way of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I first met Alan Korn, uh, I think that was 2017, not 2016. Uh, I won the Ohio Poetry Out Loud state competition, and Alan was one of the judges. Uh, right after that, um, he talked to me about performing at the Power of Poetry Festival, which I believe I was 2016 or 2017. I also became a Wellsprings uh, poet. Uh, that was 2017. Um, uh, ever since then, I just recently graduated from Central State University, which is in Wilberforce, Ohio, a historically black college and university with a mass communications degree. Uh, that I was in May of 2020. Uh, so I was the, I was the first uh, quarantine class that graduated. Uh, it was a very, uh, um, uncomfortable experience, but a growing experience at that. Um, one of the, po the poem I, uh, I'm about to perform is entitled Burnout. Uh, it's from my book. I uh, published a book um, when I was 19 called A Deferred Ambition. You can get it on YouTube. Uh, no, not on YouTube, I'm sorry. But on uh, Amazon. Um, if anybody wants that information, I'll be able to drop that in the chat. But this is entitled uh, Burnout. Uh, I grew up on the west side of Dayton, Ohio, which was uh, still right now uh, drug ridden. Uh, right now, Dayton, Ohio is the number one uh, opioid city in the world. It's the number one uh, overdose city in the world uh, for opioid, heroin, uh, and all those types of drugs. And it's something that's hit home for me um, growing up um, and witnessing a lot of things uh, at an early age. So this is entitled Burnout's an Original Monologue. <clears throat> And even though you see me do this, I better not ever, ever catch you doing it. You hear me? That's what he used to tell me. I wonder if dad told him the same thing when he was little. It seems like he hung out with a needle more than his own brother. We were close, distant, but close. But we had some great times. I remember that fight with uncle uh, on Christmas and that two hour bathroom break on New Year's and even my eighth birthday when $50 mysteriously left my card. Mom cried tears of joy when he left the house. College, she said, even though I knew he never finished high school. I never knew when he went after that, but before he crossed that threshold, I stopped him and I gave him my prized possession. A Hot Wheels car. But we're not just talking about any Hot Wheels car. I'm talking about a 1965 Pontiac Bonneville. I put it in his hand and said, I'm going to miss you. Man, just forget about me. He said. And then he walked out. Every day, I would go to sleep and dream of a day where he returned, where the laughter returned, where the sun returned. 
But that dream would turn into a nightmare and I would wake up screaming until my mother came to me and said, one day. Well, that one turned into seven and then another seven and then another seven. And what do you look? Uh, my brother's been out of the house for, for six months. But it was always this, this homeless guy down by the quickie mark that just made me remind myself that there was hope. Very frail and scrawny with a ungroomed beard, I dropped two fresh dollar bills into his cup, but it seems as if he barely wanted to look at me. Not too long ago after that, I got the call that Mark had been found dead in a McDonald's bathroom with two syringes in his arm. One thing I know is that he always found the right one in the haystack. And after finding out that my brother was gone, I went to the quickie mart and for some reason, that homeless man wasn't outside. I wonder where he would be or how he felt. And as I looked around his cardboard house, I noticed something. So, familiar. Thank you guys. Wow. Oh, that was just incredible. All of you are just like, everyone is a very tough act to follow. But Thomas, you like did not have to set me up like that. But you did. You did. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Ugh, makes you want to fist fight all the judges who don't allow you to use props at slams. But that's a story for another day. Hello, everyone. My name is Hasna Ayad Ghalib. I am a poet and visual artist from Baghdad, Iraq. I am currently serving as an artist in residence at the University of Michigan, and I'm based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, I'm going to take a deep breath real quick before I share this poem with you, and if you guys can join me in taking a deep breath real quick. This is titled Dead, as in corpses were involved. And for a bit of background information, I was born and predominantly raised in Baghdad, Iraq. Dead, as in corpses were involved. My mother says war is coming. The sky tastes the same as the day we fled Baghdad. The air sits on my tongue. My mouth spends the next 20 days reacquainting itself with the hiding feeling. Before we fled, we spent three months cooped up in a little brick house. At the dead end of Hayy al sandiest road, we hid. Dead, silent, stretched one bag of jasmine rice three months. We hid. Turned the jam to fruit before it went bad, we hid. Fine with our jasmine rice, our jam, our hiding feeling, our silence until the knocking came until we got eight minutes to grab what we could and flee in the car ride across the border. I might have asked my mother for fruit. Five years old, Hello Kitty pajamas unsoiled, I'm hungry. I have a moon pie for dinner. My mother uses the last of her cash to buy this ride. We risk being robbed and killed here. My taste buds marinate in the hum of SUV tires on dirt road. Sticky air and marshmallow, this could have been the first time I swallowed blood. Today, I watch my mother cut citrus in perfect halos. She places them in a jar with ginger 
and bathes it all in honey. She wants the fruit to last. She's turning some of it to jam. We sit together and talk about God that night. We sit together and talk about God, our voices a hymn, ringing like fresh fruit on a lover's doorstep. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining me in this moment and for sharing your incredible work. Thank you. Thank you, Hasna. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Surya. It's really fun to see everybody again. Uh, I'm Rosemary Watola Tromer, and it's my thrill to talk just a little bit more about this Wellspring program. Rumi says, on a day when the wind is perfect, the sail just needs to open and the world is full of beauty. And what is it that allows that sail to open? And I can just about promise you that every poet that you've heard tonight has had someone in their life who said, I believe in you. I believe in your voice. I believe in you showing up in this way in the world. And that's part of what we do with Wellspring. We invite, as Alan said, high school students and now also early college students to come to the ravines and gorges and, and incredible land formations in Hawking Hills. And we go on walks and we do much like we're doing here tonight. We share stories. We share poems, we share art, and, and we infuse our energy into these students for two nights together overnight and then for a performance at the end. And it's not just that. After that, then, the, then each of the participants has a chance to choose a mentor who honors the opportunity to work with them for the next year. And I want to honor some of the other poets who have done this. David Lee, who you heard last night and will hear again. Alison Luderman, who you just heard earlier this evening. And John, who was with us last night. And also Valencia Robin, John D. Lee. I didn't get all his names in. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to get to, to join with these young people. If you feel available to sponsoring our program and to helping support it financially. I hope that you will. It's ravensunpoetry.com. And we'd sure appreciate if you were able to support our work with the youth with Wellspring. At this point, we're going to take a 10 minute intermission. And when we come back, we'll have a chance to hear four more Wellspring poets, plus more other poets and storytellers. Please, um, Continue to listen. We're so glad you're here. Thank you.
2019, we had two amazing musicians here. One was Don Avery, whose cello music you were just listening to. And the other was Glenn Velez, <clears throat> who's arguably the number one frame drummer in the world. And I had a chance to talk to Glenn. He still practices every day. He has the attitude that there's so much more to learn. And we had these amazing talks where he told me how he's trying to find the beat of the world, which is a, an interesting idea and subject. So I asked Glenn and uh, his wife, Lori Kotler, to join us for this. But due to the limitations of Zoom and trying to do music uh, live, they decided that it would be best to have a video of them playing. And they came up with a brand new song that they did together. So we're going to get to see that right now. Thank you. 
we're going back to our Wellspring students. We have three more. Elijah, who's studying biomedical engineering, I believe. And um, Sarah. And Sarah did a one-woman show before the pandemic that was just amazing. It was sold out every performance in Columbus, and the pandemic prevented her from traveling around the country doing it. Um, I think she's going to be the Secretary General of the UN at some point. And uh, then play on Patrick, who's an exciting young poet who got some notoriety last year for being the opening act for Barack Obama at his virtual town hall meeting. So we're going to have those three and then a message from Naomi. Elijah. Hello, everyone. Um, it has. Hold on, can you? OK, I think I've got it now. Um, it's been so long since I've performed in front of every from anybody at all. But um, uh, really looking forward uh, to reading you guys my poem. I'm studying chemical engineering now, Alan, but uh, same vein, still uh, a lot of math science stuff. All right. This poem is called What She Wants. I want it all to come from somewhere deep. I want it to rip bits of me away as it leaves. I want it now. I want it velcro covered in thick cashmere i want it mother mary covered in god's thick cum i want it salad covered in thick french dressing i want it blasphemy i want it when i know it's bad for me i want it wrong misplaced pain i want it swallowed raw egg water fast i want it bad i want it breath so deep it tickles the kidneys I want it morning skinny and loud gas. I want it potty dance, piss after road trip. I want it released. I want it not bottled up. I want it released. I want it out in the open. I want it released. I want it take a. I want it Palestine. I want it released. I want it school to prison pipeline. I want them released. I want it redlined, people blind. I want it released. I want it tax fraud. I want it emeritus president. I want him never to be released. I want it back, this country. I want it like water on a grease fire spreading itself. I want it like it should have been meant to be. I want it to be released. I want nationwide catharsis. I want it burned hot like Phoenix. I want it raised like bird baby from embers. I want it creepy Uncle Sam spitting hateful hearts in my mouth, then keeling over to die. I want to spit hateful heart on the floor, grind under boot and kneel, my lover and I wake with the sun, and I tell her I want it released. She whispers back to me, she just wants it free. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Elijah, that was wonderful. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Abu Rashid. I'm a Palestinian American poet and public speaker talking to you from Columbus, Ohio. And I'm 21 and in my last year at Denison U University where I created a one woman show titled A Map of Myself that Alan talked about. Um, luckily I, I got to take it to Philly and Chicago but hope to continue the tour after the pandemic. I want to thank you, Alan, all the teachers, the amazing teachers we've had during Wellspring. You've influenced me more than you'll ever know. The poem I'm reading tonight, I will dedicate to Naomi Shehab Nye since she's here with us. And it's titled, Resolutions Never Get to the Point. Resolutions never get to the point. Whereas we share a father, Whereas you're the oldest of his sons and were the youngest, guardians of holy lineage. Whereas you were chosen to shine and we were guided to the light. Whereas we share a land, despite a time difference. Whereas if it were a toy, a mother would say, take turns. Whereas it isn't. Whereas involving God constitutes conflict of interest, whereas exile taints both of our last names, whereas the ultimate return is to a mother's womb, 
whereas an independence day for some is a massacre for others, whereas my mother is part mine and part yours, a transgression of blood borders. Whereas I started writing this on your day of atonement and in the spirit of forgiveness and planned to deliver it during your festival of lights. Therefore, let it be known that we have tried. Let it be known that we recognize one another from a thousand miles. Let it be known that interventions are deaf to this language of loss. Let it be known that treaty, accord, agreement are all currency for silence. Let it be known that protests aren't for sale. Let it be known that peace concerned with order is void and peace concerned with justice is rarely served, an empty side dish. Let it be known that we're human as you are, that you're human as we are, that we're not against each other, we're against the shield between us and apartheid more rigid than sieged walls. Let it be known that resolutions never get to the point, that by now hundreds are at the door calling for the speaking time I was never given to end. Thank you. poet at The Ohio State University, and this is Thanksgiving Fruit Punch. In this ballroom of a house, laughter spills over the dinner table. There is blue fire bubbling in the corner, but there are still cold feet touching the floor. Valshan's voice echoes through the halls. The staircase, a runway of Thanksgiving food, the holidays live in this house. And it almost feels like home because mother is here and she is safe in the corner, bubbling by the fire. Her body shivers in the heat. Head spinning, stomach twisting. She is on a roller coaster of conversation with nothing to say. While we smile, she is quiet, mute. Bright lights make her head buckle so her eyes are shut to this Thanksgiving. We are leaving, packing our things. Ambleside Drive can no longer be the street we park our cars on. Suitcases only hold essentials. So I'll pack my life into one, put plastic over the rest, and hope it survives the fall. Our barber tells me that when she was young, she would go to the store and get two cookies for a penny. Back then, they wrote the price on packages with crayons and she being the woman she is would erase the price and tell them how much she thought they were. What a gift to change the world with one little smudge of color. What a gift to be in a room full of people who love you but only feel the heartache of wishing. And I begged for my mom to be a penny cookie. I erase the pain and write her story all over again, but she'd know that I was lying and I'd still be worried about the bills and how two pennies don't stretch into a dollar, how this Thanksgiving Laughter runs around the room like Lily, like Jay Sino. But back home, the lights will turn out. The eviction notice will be stamped on the door, car, window. By Christmas, I'll have to have a new home. But for right now, worries are gone. Except for my mother and the fire. So maybe I'll sit back. Watch the kids run across the living room floor. Let the lights shine in my face. Let the questions roll off my grandmother's tongue. Sip the punch and eat some cookies. 
What is life but two cookies for? Thank you. For sharing your astonishing voices. What amazing poems you've shared with us tonight. Thank you, Wellspring, for supporting and encouraging these incredible, original, passionate individuals. You grace us all. To write is comforting. You know that by now. To write is mysterious and energizing. Writing gives us all a more expanded sense of who we are or might be or don't want to be. How things do and don't go together. Your poems tonight have riveted us all. I wish everybody could hear them. We celebrate your wonderful voices. We celebrate your bravery, your flashes and sparks, your incredible imagery. Thank you for the dedication, Sarah. Your wisdom, your care. Wherever you go in your lives, your writing will befriend you. And you, will befriend so many other people. Please continue to believe that the Wellspring community, the poetry community is huge. It's a great family and we're all part of it and we need you. Thank you, young Wellspring poets. Thank you, Alan and Evie for all you've done and everyone who's worked with all of you. Um. We have one more uh, art component of the program tonight. And this is from my longest friend from around here, almost 50 years now. It's hard to believe that. And looking at this face, it's hard to believe that I'm even 50. But <laughs> anyway, um, Dennis Savage's photographs, he's won many awards. And uh, his work is varied, as you'll see really embodies a lot of imagination. And Chuck Palmer also did the music for this with his friend Tom Chess, adding some little flute touches with it. So everyone can enjoy Dennis's work right now.
Well, I was talking about this program with Jack a while back, and he said it's really planned out well. And I hadn't planned it out very much. I just put the things together, and he said we're going to leave people feeling good with this last part. So we have some amazing poets and storytellers. The first one is George Bilger. Um, George was introduced to us by Billy Collins when Billy came here for a literary festival at Ohio U. And he went to prison with Evie and I and spent the morning there in the afternoon. And he read us one of George's poems and I just totally fell in love with George's sense of humor and the way he could take a poem and just make it turn on itself. Uh, George has also been a great friend to Power of Poetry. One time, the main poet we were having shafted me two weeks before the event, and I called George to ask him if he knew anyone that could do it on short notice. And he said, I love coming down there. I'll do it. And he's been one of our most popular poets ever, and I can't wait to hear what he's going to come up with tonight. So, George, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. You know, I can't, listening to you, Alan, I can't understand to this day, why why did they let uh, Billy out of prison? <laughs> never made sense to me. Um, I'm George Bilger, and uh, I'm happy to be, I guess I'm the leadoff hitter for the Mirth team, the Mirth squad, as we're known. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's been so quiet all year. Everyone talks about the fact that it's been so quiet. All you can hear, all you've been hearing are the birds. But uh, last night and tonight, we've heard all these poets you know, it's been a quiet year for poetry, and uh, I'm so happy to be part of this uh, cacophony of poets. It's so exciting to be here, uh, even though, God, I really miss uh, seeing Alan and Evie and being down there, and those of you who have visited Alan down there and have had the uh, misfortune of st staying in what I call the sensory deprivation chamber, their bedroom. <laughs> It's been a while, Alan. I hope it'll happen again soon. Um, so I will say to you what Elizabeth Taylor said to each of her seven husbands. I won't keep you long. Um, I'll just read a few poems. And uh, this first poem I'm going to read tonight. So as you can as you can tell from the wall art up here, this sort of Lascaux wall art. I have a couple of kids and I'm like the world's oldest uh, first time dad. And uh, a few years ago, I, I had the, you know, the wonderful experience of seeing my second child born. I was in the, in the, the birthing chamber and I saw this event happen. And many of you watching tonight have, have experienced that, have either had a child or have watched a child of your own be born. And you know that it, it really probably is the most extraordinary uh, experience you can have in life. To you, that is. But it's, it's not necessarily that amazing to everyone. And that's what this poem is about. The poem is called Push. And it takes place in the birthing room. I'm trying to look as if I'm suffering. I have this anguished expression on my face, but it's wasted since I'm wearing a surgical mask. And anyway, the focus here is really on my wife. And the doctor is right there between her legs and he's shouting, push! And my wife is doing this astounding thing. She's pushing yet another human being into the world, a world that so far seems to be pushing back. And the baby's heartbeat is down to 90. So the doc says, I think maybe one more try, then we do the cesarean. So things in the room really are a bit tense 
It's definitely a moment that demands a lot of attention. And my wife is gathering whatever shreds of strength remain in the shaking, exhausted sleeve of flesh her body has become. The blood and the sweat and fluids everywhere. And this is it. When I hear the attending nurse standing just behind me, saying to this guy in scrubs standing next to her, I think he's the anesthesiologist's assistant. Well, just because Karen says she has a boyfriend doesn't necessarily mean she won't go out with you. And the guy says, his voice rising because my wife really is screaming quite loudly at this point. Yeah, okay, I guess I should give it a try. I mean, what's the worst that could happen other than getting shot down and looking like a total fool? And the nurse says, as the doctor is shouting, push! Yeah, but hasn't it been like a long dry spell for you? Aren't you getting a little desperate here? And the guy laughs and my wife screams again. And the doctor says, yes! And into the world comes the bloody head, followed by the naked, lovely, bloody little boy, insanely ill-prepared for any of this. And I guess the guy actually is going to ask Karen out. And I say, go for it. <clears throat> so that's a poem about childbirth. Um, and by the way, this painting uh, is for sale. If anyone, you feel free to email me and we'll negotiate uh, a, a price, probably starting, shall we say, $5,000. Um, so one of the things we haven't been able to do during the, the plague, the virus, his travel. And uh, two summers ago, my, my wife and, and kids and I, we were fortunate enough to, to spend part of the summer in Europe. And we went to Rome. We went to Rome at the, at the worst possible time, the summer, you know, swarming with tourists, 190 degrees. And uh, we had never been there before. And one of the things you're sort of um, legally required to do in Rome is visit <clears throat> the Vatican. So one morning we got up and we knew this would be the day we would walk from our hotel to see the Vatican. And, and here's what happened in that experience. The poem is called Really Eternal, Exper really Eternal City. After we'd walked for at least an hour heading toward the Vatican, on a broiling August day, I began thinking about how long the tour we'd signed up for was going to be and how many sacred things would be on view and how much complicated information the guy would tell us about the ancient paintings and Roman numerals and relics and tombs and holy knuckle bones I knew it would all kind of just melt together and congeal into one big lumpen mass of guilt and suffering and miracles and gloomy old men in sandals. And as I was thinking this, we were passing through a shady little square where a couple of bare-breasted marble nymphs were playing in the fountain and there were no tour guides anywhere. There was no suffering or crucifixions, nor was there even one important name or date I would have to try to remember. And the cheap red wine at the sidewalk ristorante, where we ended up spending the afternoon instead of going to the Vatican, was wonderful, even miraculous as was the spaghetti bolognese. And those of you wondering how to end a poem, that line works for almost any poem, as was the spaghetti bolognese. Um, I've tried 
ending uh, Paradise Lost with that. And it's just the perfect way to end a poem. So the last poem I'm going to read, uh, some years ago, I, I went out to uh, Santa Cruz, California, where my sister lives, to visit her for a few weeks during the summer. This is a while back, but I am, you may notice, I'm just starting to go a little bit gray. And my sister said, um, you know, George, you're starting to, you're starting to gray a little bit. Um, maybe it's time you thought about dyeing your hair. Um, it would make you look younger, uh, more employable. Uh, it's, it's what people are doing now. And I, I said, no, that's ridiculous. There's no way I'm going to do that because once you start down that path, there's, there's no turning back. And she kept kind of hammering home this point. And finally I said, okay, let's do it. And we went down to the store and we, we got the stuff. And uh, this poem came, came out of that experience. Now, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, this poem has probably the best title of any poem in let's say the last decade. Um, the title of the poem is Grecian Temples. All right, hard to do better than that. Um, and, and second, okay, the, the, the second line of this poem, it's just a terrible line. It's a terrible line of poetry. And it, instead of emailing me and saying, you have to do something about that second line. I want you to understand, I'm quoting my sister. She's a businesswoman, and this is how she talks. So don't blame me for the second line of this poem. And, and here's the poem, Grecian Temples. Because I'm getting pretty gray at the temples, which negatively impacts my earning potential, and does not necessarily attract vibrant young women with their perfumed bosoms to dally with me on the green hillside, I go out and buy some Grecian hair formula. And after the whole process, which involves rubber gloves, a tiny chemistry set, and perfect timing, I look great. I look very fresh and virile, full of earning potential. But when I take my 15-year-old beagle out for his evening walk, the contrast is unfortunate. Next to me, he doesn't look all that gray with his graying snout, his sort of faded, worn out dog look. It makes me feel old walking around with a dog like that. It's not something a potential employer, much less a vibrant young woman with a perfumed bosom would necessarily go for. So I go out and get some more Grecian hair formula. Light brown, my beagle's original color. And after all the rigmarole, he looks terrific. I mean, he's not gonna win any friskiness contests, not at 15 but there's a definite visual improvement. The two of us walk virally around the block. The next day, a striking young woman at the bookstore happens to ask me about my parents, who are in fact long dead due to the effects of age. They were very old, which causes death. But having dead old parents does not go with my virile, intensely fresh new look. So I say to the woman, my parents are fine. They love their active lifestyle in San Diego. You know, windsurfing, high lie, a still vibrant sex life. And while this does not necessarily cause her to come dally with me on the green hillside, I can tell it doesn't exactly hurt my chances. I can see her imagining dinner with my sparkly, young-seeming mom and dad at some beachside restaurant where we would announce our engagement. Your son has great earning potential, she'd say to dad, who would take a gander at her perfumed bosom and give me a wink, 
just like he used to do back when he was alive and vibrant. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now on to Billy Collins. To just say, some of you might have heard of Billy Collins, probably the most famous poet, poet laureate of the United States ever and did the most to popularize poetry. Um, besides all of that, he's just a mensch. He went to the prison. He's done other things through the years, just showing what kind of person he is to us. And take it away, Billy. I think you could follow that last act all right. We'll see. Th uh, thank you, Alan. I think I'm unmuted, right? Um, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, well, I'd rather be a mensch than a nudge. Uh, and, a, and a number of other, a dozen other Yiddish expressions I can think of. And George, that was extremely uh, Bulgarian, um, right on the money. So it's a pleasure, pleasure to listen to you. Um, so I'm going to read three poems. Um, the, I'm having a birthday uh, in a few days. It's a fairly monumental one. Um, but I've resisted so far the temptation to uh, enshrine this uh, event in verse. Uh, in a moment of extreme self-seriousness, but I still have a few days. At any rate, uh, by um, coincidence, or maybe George's plan, um, I share the birthday with his first son, Michael, and uh, we're having our birthday Monday. And so I'd like to dedicate this poem to Michael, and it's called On Turning Ten. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something, something worse than any stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light, a kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche, disfiguring chickenpox of the soul. You tell me it is too early to be looking back, but that is because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautiful complexity introduced by two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I am mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then it never fell so solemnly against the side of my tree house, and my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today, all the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends, time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday, I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I would shine. But now, when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. And this is a little, uh, so happy uh, eighth birthday to Michael. Michael was born a little after I was. Uh, so. 50 decades in the uh, dog years. Uh, this is a shorter poem called uh, Cheerios. <clears throat> all true, all true. Cheerios. One bright morning in a restaurant in Chicago, as I waited for my eggs and toast, I opened the Tribune only to discover that I was the same age as Cheerios. Indeed, I was a few months older than Cheerios, for today, the newspaper announced, was the 70th birthday of Cheerios, whereas mine had occurred earlier in the year. Already I could hear them whispering behind my stooped and threadbare back, why that dude's older than Cheerios. The way they used to say, why that's as old as the hills. Only the hills are much older than Cheerios or any American breakfast cereal and more noble and enduring are the hills I surmised as a bar of sunlight illuminated my orange juice. 
And then uh, continuing with the age theme, uh, this last poem um, <clears throat> also has a, uh, it's taken on a nostalgic uh, um, uh, aroma in the beginning because it refers to uh, vigorous uh, uh, travel in all directions and by many means. And the, uh, the title is Me First. We often fly in the sky together and we're always okay. There's our luggage now waiting for us on the carousel. And we drive lots of places in all manner of hectic traffic, yet here we are pulling in the driveway again. So many opportunities to die together, but no meteor has hit our house. No tornado has lifted us into its funnel. The odds say then that one of us will go before the other, like heading off into a heavy snowstorm, leaving the other one behind to stand in the kitchen or lie on the bed under the fan. So why not let me, the older one, go first? I don't want to see you everywhere as I wait for the snow to stop before setting out with a crooked stick calling your name. So that puts an end to the mirth part. <laughs> We have a mirthful recovery from that. Anyway, thank you, Alan, for inviting me. It's great to be part of this this big uh, poetry gathering. Billy, it's great. Um, next is Dave Lee. Evie and I were rafting the Grand Canyon, and the guide at night, when everyone was lying down under the stars in their sleeping bags, would read us Dave Lee poems. And I thought, who is this guy? Who could think this kind of thing up? So I got back and it was going to be time for Power of Poetry number two. And I called Dave. I said, hey, I'm calling. I heard your poetry at the Grand Canyon and I'd like to invite you to this poetry event. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And I said, well, I can't pay you much. This was, we're just on donations. He said, oh, you're going to pay me? So he was willing to do it. <laughs> John, that's probably why you didn't get a new bicycle that year. Um, but Dave has become one of the most popular poets we've had. It's like a brother to me now. And I just have one question for you. Uh, since his dissertation was on, um, ah, Milton's, on Paradise Lost, does it really end with Bolognese of sauce? <laughs> so Dave Lee. I'm going to read a request. I'm, I am David Lee. I have not moved since last night, so I still live in Seaside. I am still in advanced training to achieve my goal of becoming a world-class piddler. As a matter of fact, my dojam, of which I am the sole member, uh, awarded me a khaki belt from Goodwill for advanced achievement in standing and staring while contemplating piddling. So that is my biography. I have a request. I have a new chat book, uh, The Allegory of Perfection. It's a triptych, and uh, I'm going to read part three. It's a three-part poem, so a triptych within a triptych. The uh, epigraph for the book is from uh, Variation Plato. We are all only shadows on cave walls. <laughs> this is the post-mortem for a self-anointed deity. And the epigraph is from uh, E. E. Cummings. One day anyone died, my guess, no one stooped to kiss his face. One. It happened on a Thursday. No one would have thought scheduled for significance outside J.R. Potts Jr.'s door at the First National Potts Bank. After he told his secretary, no, he did not wish to have a meeting with Larry Joe Williams without an appointment, hopefully four weeks in advance to talk about anything, including an $8 million loan to start a building project, including a skyscraper taller than the 13-story Great 
Plains Life Insurance building up in Lubbock for a town of maybe 4,000 with a 26,000 square foot storage facility that he said in a town council meeting could be converted and used perhaps as a banana terminal outlet in Texas. If nothing else came along, it could be used for, or especially to have him come in and lobby his credentials of aspiration <laughs> to become an elder in the Church of Christ, even though nobody in that church could vouch for his being an actual dues-paying Campbellite, even after he reminded J.R. Potts Jr. in his own role and capacity as elder in that same ecclesiastical organization that his middle name, Joe, was actually an abbreviated amamamogram for Jehovah. That name, which no one seemed to have noticed containing all three letters, his mother, incidentally, named Mary, and his father, being none other than Joseph Williams, gave him to honor his birth. Along with the reminder that if the chips fall right, he could be president someday. And J.R. Pot should give consideration to being part of that installation that being his word of the day. So when the secretary said, no, absolutely not. He couldn't go right on in without scheduling an advance appointment. Final case closed, pot to hit the road, little Joe. Larry Joe hooked up like a squat toad and said his eyes looked like they would glob smack right out of the sockets like that avocado seed did when Roy Don Staley swallowed it by accident at the church picnic that time showing off it flown 12 yards across two stretched out tables and then he gurgled like he drank a cup of Drano, his face squinched red and swole more than a teenage zit down. He went in a bunch. All she could think of to say was, God damn. But it was too late for that. He was already stone dead, they said, before he hit the floor, apoplexied. Two. When Larry Joe's wife said, hello, Sheila Morris, the dispatcher at the sheriff's office who had been given the assignment said, Mrs. Williams? She said, of course, this is my number, you dialed it. Sheila said, Mrs. Williams, I'm calling from the sheriff's office concerning your husband, Larry Joe Williams. She said, who has he pissed off now? Is he in jail yet? Sheila said, ma'am, I'm very sorry to have to tell you your husband is deceased. She said, what part of him? Sheila said, oh, he, he's dead all over, ma'am. Dr. Tubbs certified it a few minutes ago, and his body is on the way to Rufus Garner's mortuary. Oh, I mean, what part of him died first? Was it a heart attack or a brain spasm? Sheila said, ma'am, it, it could have been both. It was instantaneous. Dr. Tubbs said his mind was long gone before he fell to the ground, flat on his face, straight down. He wouldn't have felt a thing. Did he break anything I might have to pay for when he fell? And it's too bad. 
I was fixing goulash, one of his favorites for supper, and now he won't get any of that either tonight. <laughs> Three. Hello? Is this Rufus Gardner, the undertaker? Yes, I know he's there. No, I do not want to come identify the body. I'm sure you have the correct person. No, I do not want a funeral. Well, what's the cheapest way to get this done? Is that where you burn them all up? No, I don't want his ashes. Can't you do something with them? I don't care. Yes, the water scattering would be fine. Well, why would you take them there? Don't you have a toilet at the mortuary? Well, how much will all this cost? You have to weigh him? By the pound? I, I have I have a question, Mr. Garner. Is it too late to give him an enema? That could reduce the cost substantially. Sir, I don't understand what you're saying. As the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, I am trying my best to work out my own salvation, but I'm just having one hell of a time with the fear and trembling part of it so far. No, sir. No, sir. No, I am not a serious. I am a Virgo. I just want to get this all over with as fast and cheap as I can so that I can hopefully never have to think about any of this again. And I know my greatest fear is that there just may be an afterlife. And when it's my turn, he will be there waiting in the holding pen like a hog waiting to be fed. Yes, Mr. Garner, please do that. And then send me the bill. When the insurance clears, I will remit you a check. Yes, sir. And best wishes to you too. Oh yes, this is a goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. If believe it to the imagination, who was the inspiration for Larry <laughs> Joe? <laughs> um, a hint might be orange. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it's time for our storytellers. We have two great ones. The first one is my friend, Will Horniak. Uh, Will is amazing. That's all I could say. One of the funniest people I've ever encountered. And he's going to do a story now. And after the closing credits tonight, he's going to do another story, um, not for the kiddies. So, George, it's time to put them to bed after the final thing in case they're still up. Yeah. So, Will, why don't you give us a story now? Sure. Great. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Man, what a, what a blast. This has been food for the heart, for the soul, for the spirit, everything. And it's been great. Thanks for the invite, Alan. And uh, David Lee... Uh, one of the poems you wrote uh, has been essential to me for, for many years. It's the one about the laziest man who ever lived. I forget the name of it. But uh, I, I read that whenever I feel like I haven't accomplished anything because you set the bar for achievement so low that I can always feel, hey, I've, you know, I'm not doing bad. You know? And I've learned a lot tonight, too. Like tonight, after Billy Collins spoke, I learned that the hills are actually older than any American breakfast cereal. And I want to thank Mr. Collins for that who as well as being a great poet must be a geologist of some kind too. So, Well, I wanna welcome you all in my little space here. Um, I don't know if you can see in the background, this is the, the Tirnanog pub here. 
And the Chernanog pub is located conveniently in the Celtic other world, uh, which is never far from where you are. You just take a few steps beyond reason and you're there and it's open as long as your imagination is. So I'm going to tell you a little story from Ireland tonight. Chernanog actually uh, means the land of eternal youth, but um, it's, it's richer than that too. Um, Chernanog is an ancient place, so it isn't just about youth, but Everybody and everything there has a sense of vitality and, and vigor and beauty and aliveness to it. And the old Celtic idea was that you got to go there on a regular basis. And the only way to get there, though, is they would say, you've got to leave yourself behind. You know that self. You got to take off the coat of accomplishment and the little vests of achievement, you know, and the big crown of responsibility and put it down. And then you can get through the narrow door into the wide world that you're in an and once you're in Ternanog, even though you've left stuff that you thought was you behind, you feel more yourself and more vital and more alive and just like more creative. And you remember who, who you are and what you have to do. And you bring all that vitality back into this world. And um, to me, this evening, this afternoon has been a little trip to Ternanog where I remember myself and I get fed and nourished and uh, feel like uh, inspired, you know. So anyway, uh, a little tale from uh, Ireland. In County Clare, uh, there's a saying that for every uh, shovel for labor, there are 10 fiddles, just to give you an idea of the value system of County Clare. Um, and this is a story from County Clare uh, from the little village of Fecal. And it's about a woman whose name was Biddy Early. She lived, uh, she was born about 1798 from what I understand. And she was famous because um, she was a folk healer. She was an herb and berry woman. And what happened when she was a youth, uh, she did some boon. She provided some blessing to um, the wee folk or the fairy folk or the good people, or sometimes they're called the uh, other crowd. And the thing about the wee folk is if you do one good thing for them, they will return that tenfold to you. And after this boon that she provided to them, they, they gave to her or she returned anyway with this little blue bottle. But ever since then, a bit early uh, was a healer. She, she could make concoctions and libations and elixirs from every herb and bark and root and berry that grew all around her. And um, she was a bit of a counselor too. They used to say, Biddy early can pull the dagger of a bad idea out of your brain. And uh, she could cure a malady, the body, the soul, the spirit. And people came to her from miles and miles uh, around. The thing about Biddy Early, though, is that she never took money uh, for any of her healings. She said that to do so uh, would be to violate uh, the spirit of the gift that, that the wee people gave to her. Um, but people were grateful, so they wanted to do something for her. So they would bring her a, you know, a loaf of bread or some eggs or a chicken, and the men often would bring pochine, which was moonshine. And so she had a lot of that on hand. And uh, Biddy Early was the kind of person, though, that whatever she had on hand, she gave away freely. And so, you know, if you're going to have good drink around and you give it out freely, you will find people to drink it. And so her, pay, her place became sort of like a combination of a healing center uh, and a pub uh, and a community center. And uh, it, it was quite, quite renowned this little, in this little village of Fecal. Anyway, the story goes that one day uh, when Biddy Early was as old as a dirt, she herself would have said, uh, she was sweeping up in her front room. And as she was doing that, this, this knock came to the door and, and, and Biddy Early shuffled over to the door and she opened it up. And who was standing right in front of her but death himself. It was the Grim Reaper. He had the big scythe, you know, to, to harvest human souls. And he said, uh, Grandmother, I've, I've come for you now. Because you know that every person has only so many years and months and weeks and days and hours and seconds and nanoseconds and all your time has come to an end and you'll be coming with me now and she said oh she said well I, I knew you'd be coming for me I just didn't think it'd be so soon you know I feel fine I thought I had more time left but 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 I've lived a, a long life a good life I've seen many beautiful things and I've been loved and I have loved and so I'll be coming with a death uh, just as soon as I finish sweeping out the front room here because I'm not leaving a dirty house behind. And he said, uh, I don't think you seem to understand here, uh, grandmother, I'm death, and you'll be coming with me now. And she said, uh, I don't think you understand something here, young man. I've always respected the dead. I would expect a bit of respect from you now. I'm not leaving a dirty house behind. And if you were to come in here and help me, 
and quit being such a layabout out there, the two of us might get out of here all the sooner. And Death said, oh, bloody hell, you know, because he knew here was a woman that you weren't going to argue with, right? And so didn't Death himself come into her a little hut there, and he, he took the broom, and he started trying to sweep up the front room, but Death wasn't used to, to manual labor of any kind. And pretty soon, a bit early, she had gone, um, she'd gone into the kitchen. And from the kitchen, she calls out. She says, Death, Death, you're not much good at that. Come in here, Death, come in here. Um, I want you to take this knife and cut up these vegetables and these carrots uh, because I want to make a stew. I don't want to leave any food go to waste. And Death said, oh, Jesus. You know, and he, he takes the knife and he kind of fumbles around trying to cut stuff up, but he's not much good at that either. And after a while, Biddy says, um, what am I going to do with you, Death? I tell you what, go out to the main room there, stand by the door because you see guests are going to be coming soon. Uh, because it's actually a party tonight, uh, my birthday party tonight, actually my last birthday party, and I want you to welcome the guests. And he said, you want me to welcome the guests? And she said, well, you can't sweep, you can't cut up vegetables, go out there, make yourself useful. And they said, well, all right. you know." So he goes out to the front door, and now people start coming up, and death welcomes him. He says, you know, welcome. And people are like, oh, geez, you know. But, um, but this is Ireland. The people have seen far stranger things than this, you know. And pretty soon, everybody's in the house, you know. And they're having a chat and they're talking and they're having a pint and a shot and everybody's chatting away. Uh, but nobody knows what to say to death. And he doesn't really know what to say to them. Uh, but after a while, uh, the food comes out, the food is served. And uh, Biddy Early's grandson, he's about nine, he, he takes a little plate of birthday cake over to death. And he says, here, I, I, I brought this for you. And Death said, well, I'm Death. I don't eat any longer. He said, well, it's birthday cake. Everybody eats that. He said, here. And Death said, well, all right. And so he took the cake and, and, and he took a bite. But you see, <clears throat> beneath the robe, Death was nothing more than bones. And so the cake kind of bounced on his ribs and just <clears throat> fell to the ground there. And who noticed this, of course, but all the children. And there were soon a long line of them. They all wanted to feed death, you know. But he was a good sport about it. He, he ate all the food they gave him. He even drank the punch they served him. And so there were puddles of punch and piles of food at his feet. And, um, but it was around then that the music started. Uh, the pipes started playing and the fiddles came out. And, and just like that, people were up and dancing around and dancing around. And, and it might surprise you to know somebody went over to the corner there and just pulled death out onto the dance floor. And pretty soon they were dancing around with death and, and, and he danced with this person and that person and that person and this person. And as the night wore on, death danced with everyone in the whole room and they all danced with death. And the strangest thing was, it, it was the liveliest party Biddy Early ever had and the longest party she ever had. And Biddy Early had had a number of parties. But finally, it came to an end. And at the end of the party, Death and Biddy Early bid farewell to all the guests, and away they went. And she, she turned to Death and she said, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being patient with me and for, for letting me have my last party. I'm ready to go with you now, Death. And didn't she, didn't she put her hand out to him? And didn't he put that cold bony hand out of his to her? And he, he, ah, he said, grandmother, I tell you what, how about if I, how about if I come for you next year at, at this time? And she said, well, grand, uh, she said, well, death, whatever you, whatever you'd prefer, you know, no, I, I'd rather do that. You know, I, I can't remember when I've had such a good time. I, I, I don't get invited to parties often let alone having people dance with me. I'll come back for you next year. And so death went on his way. But, oh, he came back the next year. But, you see, the next year was a lot like the first year. Uh, well, save for the fact that he was a little better at sweeping and cutting up the vegetables. But the fact of the matter is those parties went on <laughs> for years and years and years and years and, and the people of that village of Fecal, they, they were quite well known for being quite empathetic and quite passionate and, and, and quite wise and quite interesting and, and a bit strange, of course. 
And many of them say, well, I don't know, but perhaps it's because we all dance with death on a regular basis and he dances with us as well. And he's not the most graceful of dancing partners, but he's certainly no one we're afraid of. Well, that's what they told me, and that's what they wanted me to tell you. Oh, but they also wanted me to tell you one more thing, which is there's another party coming up real soon, and all of us are invited. And that's Biddy Early Dances with Death. It's been great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Great. So our final storyteller is Bill Lepp. In West Virginia, I learned of Bill from his daughter and his wife at the last Wellspring. They were both wonderful people. And they said, no, oh, he's a pretty good storyteller. And listened to all of his tapes, and sure enough, he is. And he's going to show us that right now. Bill? Thank you very much. Uh, if George was the leadoff hitter, I guess I'm the last out. Uh, long ago, on the other side of the mountain, there lived a king. He was the king of little things. He was the king of keys, coins, crumbs, paper clips, pin cushions, small kindnesses, and pet names. Now, all around the king of little things, they were bigger kings. They were kings of cities, kings of counties, kings of countries, and kings of continents. The big kings made their subjects pay for everything for free, for food, for firewood. The king of little things gave anything to anyone who asked politely. The big kings all had big castles. They'd have huge parties on Friday and Saturday night. They'd make all their subjects attend. King of little things had a little cab and he might have a few friends over. The big kings all had aspirations. The kings of cities wanted to be kings of counties. The kings of counties wanted to be kings of countries. The kings of countries wanted to be kings of continents. And the kings of continents wanted to rule the world. The king of little things, he just wanted to remember his wife's birthday. Well, one day, one of the big kings, King Normus, he decided it was time to take over the world. So he got together his generals, he got together his advisors, he amassed his armies, he set out. And he crushed the kings of the cities, he quashed the kings of the counties, he conquered the kings of the countries, and he alliterated the kings of the continents. And when he thought that he had taken over the entire world, he had his tailors make him a fine suit with big brass buttons. And he had his jewelers make him a huge crown with thousands of tiny jewels. And he threw a huge banquet and he stood in front of everyone and he said, I am now the biggest king that ever was. I am the king of the skies. I am the king of the oceans. I am the king of the mountains. I am the king of American breakfast cereal. I am the king of the rivers. I am the king of the trees. I am the king of the whales. I am the king of the pachyderms. And he would have tweeted like that forever, but he took away his privileges. And then one of his servants in the back of the room raised a tremulous hand. And he said, excuse me, my enormous sire, you are indeed the king of the sky and the king of the pachyderms. But I am afraid that there is one king whom you have overlooked in your quest to conquer the world. And King Norma said, who, which, what, what king have I overlooked in my quest to conquer the world? And the servant said, sir, you have overlooked his minuscule majesty, the king of little things. And King Norma said, king of little things, king of little things, little things don't have a king. Little things exist simply to serve the bigger things. But still in all, he got together his generals and his advisors, and he amassed his army, and he set out to conquer the king of little things. Well, they got to the king of little things cabin in the evening, and the king of little things was in the kitchen doing the dishes. Because, as David Holt says, no man has ever been willingly shot in the back while doing the dishes. So, the king of little things saw the big king's armies he knew that in the morning they'd attack so he went out on his front porch and he respectfully asked some of his subjects if during the night they would invade the big king's camp and in the morning the big king's soldiers couldn't attack chiggers and ticks and mosquitoes had gotten underneath their armor athletes foot fungus had crawled down their boots and in between their toes they itched so bad they couldn't fight there were worms in the meat weevils in the wheat flies in the fruit Termites had eaten away the arrow shafts and spear shafts. They'd eaten away the cannon wheels. They'd eaten away the catapult. 
So King Norman's requisition new equipment, arrows with steel shafts, spears with steel shafts, steel wheels on the cannon, the steel catapult. So the King of Little Things asked his friend Rust to ride his friend Dew into the Big King's camp. And once again, when the Big King soldiers awoke, they couldn't attack. Rust had eaten through the armor, it had eaten away the arrow shafts, the cannons wouldn't roll, and the catapult was now about as dangerous as a cantaloupe. And King Normus was in his enormous tent, marching back and forth. What am I going to do? How can I defeat this king? I can't defeat this king. He controls the little things to create chaos. And then he had an idea. He said, I know what I'll do. He said, I'll cheat. He said, I'll lie. Because the king of little things is not the king of lies. Because a lie, no matter how small, is never a little thing. King Norman said, send a soldier with a flag of truce. Tell him to go and get the king of little things. Bring him to my tent. We'll discuss the situation of the siege. And when he gets here, we'll capture him and we'll throw him in the dungeon. Well, they sent the soldier and the king of little things came with him. He knew what was happening, but he also knew that his subjects would come to his aid if need be. And as soon as the king of little things walked into King Norman's headquarters, all of the little things recognized their king. The coins rolled out of King Normus's coffers, bowed down before the King of Little Things. The jewels jumped out of King Normus's crown. The fillings fell out of his teeth. The buttons jumped off of his coat. His suspenders surrendered. His belt broke and his pants fell down. Now, if you were second graders, you'd be laughing right now. So there stood King Normus, trying to hold out both his pants and his pride. And he was so angry, he said, throw him in the dungeon, throw him in the dungeon. But when they got to the dungeon, once again, all of the little things recognized their king. The keys in the jailer's hand refused to unlock the locks. The nails jumped out of the doors and bowed down before the king of little things. King Norma said, put him in a cave, put him in a cave, put a rock, put a big rock in front of the cave. No food, no water, till he surrenders his kingdom. Well, the king of little things went to the cave, and life wasn't entirely unpleasant in the cave. The ants brought him crumbs, the bees brought him honey, the birds brought him seeds, and little drops of water made their way down through the mountain and dripped into his mouth. But after a while, he missed his queen, he missed his cottage, he got a little bit bored. So the king of little things asked the ants and the birds and the bees to take a message to the little things everywhere. And the ants carried the words like crumbs, and the bees painted the words on the flowers, and the birds dropped the words from the sky like rain, and all over the world, little things began to happen. Strings unstrung, hangers unhung, springs sprung, tables toppled, chairs folded, easels eased away, quills quit, quilts quivered, bolts bolted, boats listed, fires froze, pickles undilled, bread broke, cookies crumbled, ticks and tocks left their clocks, everything, everywhere quit working. And everybody knew that it was King Normus's fault. <clears throat> and they demanded that he release the King of Little Things. Well, King Normus could see that he was beat and he wasn't going to do that. So he simply surrendered his crown and he loaded some of his enormous possessions into his enormous wagon, including his enormous wife, she was very tall, and off they rode. And the people presented the crown to the king of little things, who asked very little of his new subjects, except that they leave crumbs for the ants, plant flowers for the birds and the bees, oil hinges regularly, tip generously, and say please and thank you. And everyone lived adequately ever after. Except, of course, King Normus, who could never find his wallet or his comb or his pocket watch. And maybe even he will someday learn that it's the little things that matter the most. Thank you.
All right, Will, you ready to do this? I am, I am. Uh, Alan told me that this is for mature audiences, but I figured if Alan is the standard of maturity, we're all in bad shape. So I don't know what that means, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is a little Irish tale of uh, two two women, um, Mary and Moira, and they lived at the edge of the village. Uh, they each had a little uh, whitewashed cottage with a thatched roof. And um, it was sad because they had been widowed quite young in their 20s. They'd been widowed uh, by, the, by the Great War, the Great World War, the First War. And um, they each lived, you know, by themselves in their own little hut, but they shared a common field. And they farmed the field together. And um, you could see them out there one day in the spring, Mary and Moira, they were down on their hands and knees and they were planting spuds. That's pretty much what they had, potatoes, potatoes to eat, potatoes to sell. That's what they had, potatoes. But that was fine. And they were on their hands and knees and they were just talking back and forth. They, were, they, they, they chatted constantly. They were best friends. And on this particular day, they were discussing uh, one of their favorite subjects, which was uh, penises. You know, they, they missed their husband's penises. And so they were talking about penis this and penis that and, oh, this grand penis and how big it was. and that. Penis, 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 and, oh, 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 penis, penis, penis. And they were chatting it up so much they didn't even notice. That down the lane was coming Father Peter O'Connell, you know, on his way to visit the ladies there. And a man who was certainly opposed to any pleasures of the flesh whatsoever. And they didn't notice now he was standing just on the other side of the stone wall as they were planting the spuds and yakking it about, about, about penises. And all of a sudden he says, well, good morning, ladies. And they look up and they, oh, oh they see the priest, you know. And... And, and they don't know what he's heard and they're embarrassed and their embarrassment kind of confounds their words. And both of them blurt out at the exact same second. They say, good morning, Father Penis. Oh, no, 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 good morning, Father Peter. Father Peter O'Connell, good morning, Father Peter. Father Peter, good morning. And he said, I heard what you two said. Not only that, I've been listening to your confessions for years. <clears throat> and it's time you two learn a lesson. If it's the penis that both of you want, it's the penis that you'll be gotten. And they thought, what? And they watched as he stretched his hand out over the field. And he called out to the heavens and he said, Lord Almighty in heaven, I pray that from this day forward, this field never produce another potato. Did it produce nothing but penises? And they said, no, Father, please don't curse the field, because there was nothing stronger than the curse of a priest, you know. But Father Peter O'Connell, when he'd made up his mind, he'd made up his mind, and down the road he goes, you know. And they just didn't know what to think, you know. But every day they would kind of come out and look down, you know. And Now, those of you who have been to Ireland, you know that the Irish earth is is fertile and rich and fecund and, and it'll grow, you know, potatoes and it'll grow tomatoes, it'll grow persimmons and, and it turns out that it, it, it will grow penises. Didn't they come out there one day to notice just a, a, a few of them just poking through the ground, just these little things, you know. But uh, with the good Irish sun and the wind and the rain, you know, they grew and grew and grew, and there were some short squat ones in front and some middle-sized ones. And then, you know, the, the, the ones in the back got the sun, and so they would kind of wave in the breeze back and forth. It was a, it was a beautiful penis field, but, but they didn't know what to do. They thought, what can we, we're going to be destitute. You know, what are we, we don't have any potatoes, and all we have is this, and oh, my God, what, what can we do, you know? But the one day that they were about ready to pull their hair out, you know, uh, they happened to notice. Uh, the one man uh, coming down the lane who might be able to shed some light on this situation, and that was Peddler Tim. You see, Peddler Tim, he uh, he was a bit of a man of the world because he peddled a, a five-county region round, so he had seen a few things. And he did what he always did. He had the, the donkey there with the wares on the back, you know, and he was leading it down the lane, and he, and, he, and he tied the donkey off to the tree, and he packed his pipe, and he walked across the lane, and he said, well, good, good afternoon, ladies. He said, how are the... How are the potatoes growing? How are the oh? He said, "You're you're not growing potatoes this year, are you?" He said, "Is that a penis field?" He said, um, "I've never seen one. It looks like a healthy one, though. Uh, what do you plan to do with them?" They said, "We don't know what we're going to do with them, Tim. We're going to be destitute. What can we do with that? You know?" And he said, "No, no, no, no. Wait, wait a minute, ladies." He said, "You know, if there's one thing that my occupation my trade as a peddler has taught me over the years it's that uh, there is a market in this world for just about everything now it might take a while to find the market for that uh, but but i tell you what i'll do 
why don't you uh, pull a few of them out there and give them to me on consignment, so to speak, and I'll, 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 I'll see if there might be some sales uh, possible. They said, Tim, would you do that? That would be grand. So didn't they pull a few of the painters out of the ground? And, and it, it did. I can see the men already feeling like, oh, ouch, you know, but they did. And some of them, they, they wrapped up, they put in little socks, you know, and some of them, they, they wrapped up in a napkin. And some of them didn't have to cut a tablecloth in two to wrap up those big bad boys. And they gave those to Peddler Tim. And, um, and he put him on, on the donkey along with the rest of his wares, you know, and he went out his way, you know. And he would go to, you know, the fairs and the markets and the squares, the crossroads, wherever a few people gathered. And he would spread out the penises, you know, and he'd, he'd cry, you know, pots and pans for sale, knives and needles, ribbons, bows, penises, toro penises. And there was quite a bit of interest, but no sales to speak, of, you know, um, until one day he was at the square there. And he was just about ready to pack up because it was getting late. Most people are all on their way to supper. When he hears, he hears, um, Peddler Tim, Peddler Tim, how, how much would that, that penis there in, in, in the corner of if your blanket cost, that, that, that large one there? And Peddler Tim turned and looked, and it was, it was Mother Superior from a nearby convent. And um, he immediately got to thinking, and he said, uh, well, Mother Superior, um, a penis like that, a fine quality, would bring a, a good price anywhere. But I'll, uh, I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to give you that penis for half price. If uh, if you're satisfied with it, you would just pass the word along to some of your colleagues there in the convent. And she said, well, Tim, I'd be happy to do that, of course, you know. And he sold her the penis and she took it, you know, and away she went. But she stopped and she called back and she said, Tim, Tim, I, I forgot to ask is there a little booklet that it comes with, instructions or something? You know, I've never had one before. And he said, oh, mother, there's, there's, there's nothing easier to operate than, than one of these. I, I tell you what, all you have to do is you lay down in a comfortable position. Um, and at first, you, you have to realize that you keep the penis in a safe place. Put it in a box or something, you know, keep it away from dogs and cats. You know, they'll bury it or chew it up, you know. But when you want to use it, you lay back, you find a comfortable place, and you just say, ready, you say this, you say, Go, penis, go. Right? Can you all try that with me? Ready? I'm going to see you. Ready? Go, penis, go. I can see there's quite a bit of experience out there here. That's very good. Well, <laughs> so she took it home, and Mother Superior uh, had a lovely, lovely evening. And she awoke refreshed, and she awoke just enlivened, and didn't she go off to do great works of Christian charity, you know? And, of course, she was pleased, and so she spread the word, and pretty soon, um, Mary and Moira were making more money uh, selling penises than they would have made in a lifetime of selling potatoes. And, and the thing was, it was all happening in secret, you know. But these nuns uh, had a reputation of being uh, joyful and happy and just filled with energy. So much so that even Father Peter O'Connell would mention them in his sermons at times, you know, saying, see what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when people turn away from the pleasures of the flesh and embrace the Lord with their whole heart and body and mind. And of course, the exact opposite was happening, but the Lord was being served and everything went along swimmingly <clears throat> until... <laughs> until the day of the great religious convocation. You see, it was a great convocation where all of the nuns and all the priests and the bishops, they had to get together for this great meeting. You know, it's gonna last a week or so, maybe longer. And of course, Mother Superior was invited, wasn't she? And, uh, and she was so concerned about the meeting and such that in her haste of packing, uh, she forgot to pack her penis, you know. And, um, you know, she'd been away, she was away for about four or five days and um, she was sort of, uh, used to this, you know, nocturnal uh, adoration meditation that she would have in the evenings. And so um, she said, uh, she said to the priest that was heading up the convocation, I just need to, to, to return to the, to the convent quickly. It'll just take a, a day or so and I'll, and I'll be right back. He says, no, 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 you can't be doing that. We'll send, uh, we'll send one of the houseboys to get whatever it is that you need, you see. And she said, well, all right. And she talked to the houseboy and she, she told him there was a box underneath her bed. And that's what she wanted. And if you open it, you'll be known death and eternal damnation. So don't open the bloody box. And he was a good boy. He never would have done such a thing. And he went on his way and uh, he knocked on the door and the nuns found the box. They gave it to him. And wasn't he walking down the road? Now you can see him walking down the road back to the convocation. It was a fair, fair walk. And who was, who was coming up behind him now in the buggy? 
uh, with the horse, but Father Peter O'Connell. You see, he'd been doing important business elsewhere, was coming to the convocation late, and he was coming down the road uh, with his horse and his buggy, and he passed the boy and found out the boy was going to the convocation. So, well, wouldn't he be offering him a ride? Wouldn't he do that? Of course. And the boy said, yes, no. And so he, 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 brought, he, he got up there, and you could see it was Father Peter O'Connell, and then the house boy and the box with the penis right between the two of them, you know. And um, Father Peter O'Connell had named his horse after his favorite saint. It was Saint Pius, you know. And he took the reins and he said, okay, go, Pius, go, go, Pius, go. <clears throat> well, you know, go, Pius, go to a penis in a box sounds a lot like go, penis, go, you know. And the fact of the matter is penises, they, they don't hear that well. And they, they don't really listen much either. But this penis, you see, it had been sort of denied its pleasure for quite some time. So didn't it just come flying out of that box like a heat sinking missile, you know? And um, I think an essential point here is that I tell you uh, that in those days, you see, the priests of Ireland, they, they didn't wear pants, they wore robes, you see. And so the penis came right for him. Without getting too deeply into detail here, suffice it to say, it took Father Peter O'Connell and the houseboy's strength uh, and, and, and a stone to convince that penis that Father Peter O'Connell was not an appropriate object for its affections. And didn't they sort of beat it into a bloody pulp and put it in the box? Well, it was a rather stony ride in silence, you might say, they had to the convocation. And the next day, <clears throat> Mother Superior was called into the office there, where sat Father Peter O'Connell and the box upon the desk. She told him the entire story from beginning to end. And when Father Peter O'Connell realized that the curse that he put on the potato field had in fact backfired into the greatest outbreak of carnal pleasure and sexual delight ever known by the nuns of Ireland, when the full weight of that came to him, <laughs> he died. Father Peter O'Connell, he died. And when he died, the curse of the field, sorry to say, ladies, it died with him, you see. And from that day forward, uh, Mary and Myra's field produced potatoes, no longer penises. But from that day forward, um, penises are sometimes called Peters in honor of Father Peter O'Connell. And uh, from that day to now, priests in Ireland generally wear pants, uh, no longer robes, you see. And I just want to finish by saying it was Peddler Tim who entrusted me with that story. And, you know, he told me it happened exactly that way. And, you know, if we can't trust Peddler Tim, well, who can we trust? And that's the tale. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs>